we're pleased this evening to be having the program Searching for Barton Carter uh, with one of his descendants, Nancy Carter Clough. She was raised in Hollis, New Hampshire. She went to Colby College in Waterville, Maine, and received her graduate degree from Notre Dame College. She was a school psychologist in Central High School for 35 years. Upon retirement, she wrote a book about her uncle, Barton Carter, who went missing uh, during the Spanish Civil War. It was a labor of love that took her seven years to research and write. So welcome, Nancy. Thank you. I feel really at home here because I was brought up in this area. I went to, to Dan, I, I, although I was in Hollis, I always came to Nashua to do a lot of shopping or I would take ballet lessons and music lessons and that sort of thing. And my family really has a huge footprint here in, in this city and I just feel a real connection with this city. And I married my husband, Charlie Clough, um, 35 years ago and he worked for the same company that my parents, my grand, great grandfather started in 1900. So there was a big um, footprint for the Nashua Corporation as well. So it's really great to be here and I just feel so at home. And I'll start um, about, about telling you why I did this and it's kind of, a, kind of an interesting story um, I was a school psychologist in the central New Hampshire area for 35 years and I was going to retire and I had so many grandchildren and I thought this is going to be great and I'm going to spend time at the garden, in the garden and we had bought a house in Rhode Island at the coast so we're going to be at the beach and then I started having these dreams and they were really very unsettling dreams where I would dream that I was in Spain and I, I, I had been to Spain several times, um, so I was very, I, I understood where I was. And I was walking in the La Mancha, that they call the Don Quixote, used to, to, to go with Sancho Panza. And I, I was really, there was sagebrush all over the place, and it was just, then it was very, very windy, and I saw this old mine. And, and it had some, uh, and it was, it, it had all these, these um, pieces of wood outside. And I thought something was driving me and I had to go down in that mine. And I thought, Nan, you're crazy. You're never going to get back up. You can't go down there. So I went down there anyway, and I went down, and it went down on a 45 degree angle. And I was in this little space, and I kept thinking how crazy I was the whole time I was in there. But something was pushing me, and I got to the bottom of the, um, I got to the bottom of the mine and all of a sudden there was this light and there were all these papers all over the floor and they were writings from my uncle and from my grandmother. I recognized her writing to my uncle in my, my, um, in, in her diary that had things about my uncle and then my uncle also, um, he had written letters as well. And so I thought, well, I have to bring these up. I have to bring them up and I have to show somebody these things. I just have to do it. So I grabbed them all and I thought, how in the heck am I gonna get back up? But somehow I did and as soon as I did, I saw this big light coming down on these. And then I figured I have to write a book. I knew, I had heard the story of my Uncle Barton who went missing 23 years um, uh, when he was 23 years old in Spain, and I knew that I had to write a book about him. And I ne had never written a book before. I didn't think I could write a book, but it was like I, if I didn't do it, I would never be content. So I started my journey, um, and and I I. Um, I dragged Charlie all over Spain where we did a lot of research. He was really good all over the battlefields, finding the orphanages my grand, my uncle had, had, um, had, had worked in and this sort of thing. Um, and I really had to do it. It was something that I felt he never, he always wanted to write a book, he never did. And so this is really his life in this book. So this is what made me write it. And it was an absolute labor of love. Um, and I, you know, I, 
I'm so glad that I did. So we're starting off right here. The name of the book is Searching for Barton Carter. Um, and it's a story, his story. And it's by his niece. And I never met him because he was dead far, about eight years before I was, I was um, born. Okay, this is the, the um, Carter family home. And you all probably recognize this. This is the, the uh, yes, this is, this is the Red Cross house. Okay, and what happened after Barton died, this was his family house here um, where he was baptized and raised. Um, and they wanted to have some sort of a memorial to him. And at that time, uh, it was 1941, and they looked far and wide to do something to, to honor his life, my grandparents did. And the Nashua Red Cross at that time was just really, really vital. And they were doing so much work. And they were rolling bandages for people in the war, in World War II. And there were so many volunteers. And they were just bursting at the seams. So they decided what they'd do is give their house to be, um, uh, to be a memorial to, to their son. And if any of you have gone in there, there's a big plaque over the, over the fireplace um, that has some of his pictures. They have a bar relief. It's made out of bronze. And it has um, pictures of the truck he used to drive and also um, a lot of uh, excerpts out of his letters there. So um, the, Nashua, the Carter family has been here for, uh, in Nashua for a long time. Um, the, offices on Franklin Street that used to be the Nashua Corporation, they were um, a card shop in 18, about the 1840s. And what they used to do is they used to make f playing cards and then they'd sell them to the people who were going in the gold rush because they didn't have much to do at, ni at night other than search for gold. So they used to um, uh, play cards. So um, Rich James Richard Carter, um, owned a company called Carter Rice in Boston, and it was a paper company, and it did uh, processing of paper and that sort of thing. And there was a big fire in the coated um, paper, um, where they in the gum tape. So he decided, and it was they they lost the whole um, part. So what he decided to do, he went and he bought all those uh, buildings on Franklin Street, and he had two sons graduating from Yale. Winthrop, who's my grandfather, graduated in 1907. And uh, so he, James bought the buildings in 1904 for all that go, um, the tape and the, and the, the coded paper. And then um, for Winthrop, who was going to gra who graduate from Yale, um, and he was the treasurer of that office. Um, in 1909, Winthrop married Elizabeth, my grandmother, and, and his brother Elliot, that you probably all know, he was very instrumental in giving the library for the city. And my Aunt Edith was an, an amazing lady and did all the gardening for, the, for, for um, some of the public buildings around here when she was very old. Um, and Elliot used to walk all the way from his house on Elliott Street all the way downtown when he was practically blind and he couldn't see. Just an amazing, amazing guy and they were just very philanthropic for the Nashua um, community. Um, so in 1909, Winthrop, um, Winthrop purchased this house from the Pages and then they lived in that house until um, in, in, 1949, I mean 41, when they gave it to the Red Cross. So this is, um, Barton was, was baptized in that house, and he was their third child, and these are the other children, my grandmother and grandfather, and Barton is in the back. My father was the youngest in the front. And then there was Sydney and Catherine. Now this is our house in Hollis. Um, and this was a house that I was raised in, um, and Randy Forgart lives there now. Um, and Barton was raised in this house in the summer. 
and this house was purchased in 1921 and it was fa a farm and it was owned by the Colburn family and it was a very active farm at that point in time. And the Carters bought it and they used it as their summer residence. So they lived in Nashua in the winter time and then in, in the summer they came out and they lived here and they had horses and they grew all kinds of vegetables and they had pigs and cows and um, it was a really lovely working farm at that point in time and loved by the whole Carter family. Now this is um, Elliot um, and uh, when James Richard, the fellow who owned Carter Rice, he died in 1923 and Winthrop became the president of the company and Elliot became the treasurer. Now they both took hiatuses for um, World War I and, and uh, Elliot was actually in both wars. So this is Barton, my uncle. About, the book is about him. And he went to a private school called the J.M. McDuffie School. And he was there grades one through five. Then he went to the Thesinan School where he boarded, at which point he went to St. Paul's in Concord, and then on to Williams College. Nancy, yeah, so one quick question. Is that J.M. McDuffie School in Nashua? It was in Nashua. I Well, I didn't either, but it was in all my grandmother's diaries and yeah, yeah. Now, um, Barton uh, left Williams with his junior year because he fell madly in love with this woman from England who came to, um, who came and lived with one of her um, uncles who lived next door or not too far from Barton. And her name was Joe Kent and Joan Kent, and he fell madly in love with her, and he wanted to marry her, and my poor grandfather and grandmother were out of their mind because they wanted him to finish college. So he finally agreed, I'll finish college, I want to get married first, I'll get married in England, and then I'll come back and I'll finish Williams College. However, two weeks before the wedding, she gave him, the, he, she said that she wanted to postpone the wedding, she wasn't ready to get married. So he, he, his, he had his heart broken and he was one of these people that always got everything that he, that he wanted. Um, when he went to Williams, he got in every single fraternity. He was always kind of the golden boy. Um, he, would, he would be the one that everybody would want to dance with at the dances and he'd have women after him, but he, and this is the first time he'd ever had anything like that happen to him. So uh, he, he, he took it very hard and he went back to, to England and he took a job at an equities firm and hoped to get her back, um, which he never did. Uh, so at any rate, what he, he ended up doing is he um, met this fellow who was a Spanish nationalist who just gotten out of Spain before the Spanish Civil War. The Spanish Civil War was going on. And so he talked him into going to Spain. Um, so Barton obtained a, a press pass, which, um, and he was able to go into Spain for two weeks and write about the war. Um, so just a brief history of the Spanish Civil War. Um, we have two sides of the Spanish Civil War. There's the loyalist side, which is the Republican side, and you have the leftist Republicans or the skilled workers, um, the shopkeepers, small business owners, and then you have the anarchists, the ones that always wanted to make trouble and there was no Everyone it was exactly the same. There was no order to anything. And then there was the Trotskyites, or the workers, the anti-Stalinists. They, so they, they, were, they didn't get along with Stalin or the Communist Party at all. They were more the workers' party, the Marxists, that sort of thing. Then you had the Socialist Party, um, and then you had the Communist Party. So all of those fought on the Republican side. Then the nationalist side, you had the monarchists, which were, they wanted the monarchy to be restored, the fascists so that were um, kind of into Hitler and Mussolini and that sort of thing, and then the right-wing business conservative group. 
Um, so they were, this is the two sides that fought in this war. And the war lasted from July of 1936 to um, April of 1939. So the goals of this was the, the loyalists and the republicans, they wanted to main, they had a democracy in Spain um, that they, they all um, uh, just had won election in February of 1936. And so they just, they wanted to have this democracy and they wanted to fight against the oppression that they had had and enhance the rights of the people. Well, the nationalists wanted to fight against communism, they wanted the monarchy to come back, and they wanted to overthrow the democratic elected government. So to have it um, function the way it did previously. So this is sort of a timeline of the Spanish Civil War. Um, uh, the Popularist Front, this is the first republic that came. Um, in Spain, it was the, the monarchy. They all got all the money. The people um, that they were the ones who, they had all the schools. None of the young people used to go to school except if they were Catholic and had money. So it was the landowners and it was the monarchists and it was the big business owners. Um, and they also, uh, the big landowners, what they would do is they would hire people and then they fire them at a whim. So it was very hard for people to, to get a job and to work. Kids didn't go to school because um, they, they uh, only had the, the Catholic children were only able to go to school or their people with money did. So they all, in this election, they wanted to fight for the rights of the, of the kids and all of the people to own land, um, to be able to go to school. Um, so anyway, they did win and it was, and it was wonderful, except um, in, in July of uh, 1936, there was a right-wing military uprising um, in, in Spanish Morocco and it was headed by um, General um, Francisco Franco. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to, um, it was an insurgency and he wanted to take over all the cities that had this popular um, populist front government on it. So Hitler and Mussolini decided to go along with him because they figured this is a way we're going to be able to learn how to do things like bomb out of planes and we're going to be able to, hmm? Yeah, well, I'm going to learn this, he says. So I'm going to join along with it. So this is what he did. Um, they, they joined along, and then they were able to go into Seville, and then France all of a sudden closed their borders, and they said, we don't want anybody going in. We don't want anybody sending arms in. You just stay away. And this is spearheaded by Neville Chamberlain, who didn't want to get involved in anything. He just wanted to say, OK, we just, this is separatists. We're just not going to look. We're not going to get involved. We're going to just, we'll give Hitler and Mussolini whatever they want as long as they leave us alone and we don't give a darn what they do to other people. Um, it's kind of, kind of like some, kind of a little bit like what's going on today. Um, so, uh, and so, so they had all these people from fighting from, from Germany and from Italy. They had the fascists and they had some of the Nazis. They were all fighting, um, and so the, the populist government really didn't have any weapons or they didn't have very much at all because they closed all the borders, and if somebody came in, they'd have to go to jail. So they were really between a rock and a hard place, and I don't think they ever had a chance um, at all. So anyway, the Soviets came to fight. They were about um, uh, to fight with the Republican forces. Um, and, and they were followed by 600 freedom fighters from different countries. And these were known as the International Brigades. I don't know if you heard of those, but they were divided into seven brigades. There was Abraham Lincoln, and that's the, the brigade that, yeah. This is the brigade from, from the United States. There was the British Brigade. Um, uh, and then they had one from Italy and Poland. They had a lot of people from these brigades were made up of people who uh, were communists and were kicked out of 
places like Germany or Jewish and they were kicked out of Germany and they were picked, kicked out of other European countries. So they made up a lot of the brigades or people who were um, laborers. They came and they, they fought because they really saw when they were in these countries, they saw what happens with, um, uh, they saw what happens with, um, uh, with fascism and how fascists just go ahead and they just have no regard for any of the laborers or, or any of anybody who's of a different race than they are or a different belief. I mean, the communists were being persecuted, the Jews were being persecuted. Um, so this is, this is when they started to say, okay, we're gonna go fight against fascism because we really think it's horrible what's happening. So anyway, the Spanish Civil War ended in, um, in April of 1939, and the nationalists prevailed. And then right after that, Hitler invaded Poland. So anyway, I was talking about um, Barton, Barton's trip to Barcelona. Um, he, he went on a train and went through, um, it was very hard for him to get his salve conducto or his pass, but he finally got it. He went on the train to Barcelona um, and it was very, very difficult because they had people going on all the time on the trains looking at it, everybody's papers and everything else. And by the time he got into Spain, everybody in his car had gone. They would all had gotten off somewhere else because they weren't allowed, if they were going to fight, they weren't allowed to get into Spain. They had to go and walk over the Pyrenees Mountains because they weren't allowed into Spain. Um, so he comes down, he goes to the Plaza de Catalonia, which is the main drag, and there are all these people that represent different um, parts of, they have the laborers, they have the communists, they have the socialists, and they all have all these different tasseled hats and flags and everything, and there are all kinds of people singing and dancing and canary vendors and whatnot, and he meets this communist nurse named Penny. And Penny takes him all over the place for the two weeks he's there. Um, and she has been working at the front with the International Brigade. So she takes him to the orphanages and to the International Brigade and the Ministry of Propaganda. They, they develop this propaganda so they can show it all over the world so people will come and help them in Spain. And the, they had a, in the exposition grounds, um, uh, and the orphanage, the exposition grounds that they, they were um, going to have like a world's fair situation and it never really, really happened um, because of the war going on. So um, they, they had something and they, so what happened, they had it all ready to go and there were people that were refugees that were camping out in the whole exposition ground areas that came from areas that had been bombed. Um, so also he, he really was a very friendly fellow, Bart was, and he met um, a lot of people that he spent a lot of time with. Um, he was walking across the road and there was some gunfire and there was a little boy that was going across the road with his um, mother and he dropped his teddy bear. And so Bart saw that and then the, the mother took Jamie across the road and the little boy was crying and crying and the guns were, sh were going off. So he went, Bart got the, the teddy bear and he ran up and he gave it to them and then they took him in the back of this store. Um, and so he became very friendly with that, with that family. In that store they used to sell leather jackets and I'll show you what he looks like in his leather jacket. So one of the reasons that he went to Barcelona, he went, met with this nationalist soldier. And apparently what they used to do is when the um, uh, Republicans took over, they used to um, take all, there's so many rich people and they'd come and they'd take their homes and then they would steal their jewelry and they'd steal their all kinds of um, furniture and everything in their, their houses. So the fellow he met that's a nationalist said, I want you to, buy, my mother had a lot of her jewels taken, but I want you to go in and I want you to, to 
um, meet her in Barcelona, and then I want you to bring her jewels home to me. So we have some family jewels. So being somebody who was was very hurt by this beautiful woman that hadn't treated him very well. He thought that this would be kind of get his mind off it. So he said he would go and he would um, get her um, get her jewels. So he waited until the last part of the two weeks and he went to Barcelona to her house and she um, she talked with him for a long while and she, he had to get off way before her house. He sort of had to sneak in. And then he took her jewels and then um, to, to bring back. And then he put them in his um, pockets and in the lining of his suitcase so he could take them back over the border, which I don't think was too smart, but he did. And then the day before he left to go to Barcelona, um, the nurse Penny said to him, um, they're checking everybody and you you know they, they take their clothes off you, you you why don't you just stay here just stay in Barcelona and he he says um, no he really has to get home so he sort of got around so the people um, uh, the loyalist government needed um, or uh, some some loyalist government and and the people from England decided that they were had to get some cars driven back to England so they asked him to be a part of the convoy in the in the um, uh, in getting back through the border and when he went up to the French border there was all this there were all these people and guns and everything else and he had all these jewels and it was like oh my god this is something this is probably going to be the last of me um, and he didn't say anything, and so they had big um, insignias on their, uh, on their cars that saying they were over there to help the Spanish people. So they, they, they finally said, okay, you just go across. So he went across, and he went back to Spain, I mean, went back to England, and he gave the jewels to the son of the um, senorita or the senora over there. But while he was over there, he fell in love with the Spanish cause, he <laughs> fell in love with the Spanish people, and he decided, you know what, I'm going back over there, and I am going to do whatever I can do <laughs> over there. That's a good vibration over there. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't have to think about my, my girlfriend. Um, so this is some of the propaganda posters. For, this was in the paper. Um, the Boston Herald in 1937, and this is a espadrille of a worker woman standing on a Nazi sign on the pavement. And these are orphanages in Barcelona that he visited. So this is my uncle when he went to visit um, Jamie with the teddy bear. He had a leather jacket store, so he ended up buying a leather jacket. So that's his leather jacket. And he probably wore that all the time while he was over there. Um, so then he, de he decided, I'm going to go back to Spain, but how can I get there? Um, and what was really amazing is that the British, that they were really going out of their way for everybody in Spain. So even the workers would take out 10% of their wages to give to Spain. I mean, and they didn't make very much as it was. And then they had... Um, all kinds of people that were working on behalf of the Spanish of the, of the Spanish cause because I mean this was a duly elected government it was and then here you have Franco and you have Mussolini and Hitler with all their guns and everything else trying to take over their country and trying to take over the newly elected government and I mean, they'd work so hard to get schools for everybody, and they work so hard to get land for everybody, and they just didn't want to. They didn't want to lose everything that they they'd gotten. So the Brits and really felt very strongly for them. Um, and then the Quakers opened canteens in Barcelona and Madrid, and they fed fed all the refugee children. Um, and then there was the National Joint Committee for Spanish Relief. And this was um, started by a member of parliament, the Duchess of Ath Athol. 
And what she did, there were so many organizations, and they all stood on each, got on each other's toes, and they didn't work together, and it was a mess. So she decided that she was going to get them all together and tell them all what to do, so they all would be doing, they wouldn't be trying to do the same thing and redoing everything, but do it in a very organized fashion. And also, then you could give to them, and you wouldn't have to duplicate the costs for the services. Um, so he was hired by um, the Duchess of Athol in the National um, Committee for Joint um, Spanish Relief. And he drove a two-ton Bedford truck to evacuate refugee children from Madrid. So Madrid, there was the war, war was, the battle was going on the front was there all the time. And it was very hard for anybody to win because you had mountains on one side, river on the other, and they, you just could not, it, it just would be, um, you wouldn't get a, 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 a winner at that, at that time because of the topography of it. So what he would do is there were all these um, international brigade and all these um, Spanish um, Republicans and they'd be fighting in the Madrid area. So he would drive um, with supplies from Valencia, which was the capital of Spain at that point, to Madrid, deliver the supplies, and then he'd bring um, a whole bunch of orphans back to Valencia, and they'd have them live in orphanages away from the battle, or live um, in in uh, in and with families over there. So he would do this um, all the time. And this is his truck over here, and there he is with his hat on, um, and he's loading the supplies, and he talks a lot about his his drivers, Farr, Wilton, and McBain. Um, and they, they decided they, um, when they decided to go back to Spain, they had all these people who were reporters over there. And they also had um, people that were seeing them off because they were so happy. They'd give supplies and they were so happy that somebody was going to give supplies to the Spanish people because they needed all those supplies. And here they are. Um, and it says, Ayuda de Gran Bretaña um, uh, para los niños, which is the help the, the Great Britain is given for children. And this is the Hotel Victoria, and this is where he stayed when he was uh, down in, in, in uh, Valencia. And it's where Charlie and I stayed how many years ago. So it was kind of fun to live in the same place. But it was very different because there were like six people to a room. People were in the halls. People were sleeping in the bathtubs. So it was very different when we were there. But it was kind of nice because you could kind of get an idea of how they were. Did they were. Nice <laughs> I One night I wanted to sleep in the bathtub because my husband was snoring a little bit. But I never, <laughs> never made it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, this is, he was writing um, to his parents, and this is a letter that he wrote in March to them. Um, and he was very passionate about what was happening, and he was talking about the fascists when they take a city and what happens. Um, and the Malaga, the city of Malaga, um, was bombed and people had to walk to Almira, which was 150 miles away. So they saw, so he was, he's talking about it and what happens. When the fascists take a city, they find it practically deserted. As in the case of Malaga, women and children walked 150 miles from Malaga to Almira uh, rather than stay in a city under the fascists and they were shelled from the sea as they walk, walked. Women and children on foot struggled along. Women gave birth by the roadside and got up and struggled on. When they arrived in, in Almeria, they slept on the streets in the square. Fascist planes came over. They didn't bomb the government ships in the harbor. They didn't bomb the soldiers' barracks. They bombed the people in the square and killed 800 people and wounded scores of helpless worn out women and children. So he was really, um, he was really just taken by all of this and 
I, I think we see some of this today where they, they target the women and children, um, which is a horrible, horrible, horrible thing. Civil wars are awful. So this is his first evacuation from Madrid, and this is called um, Puerta del Sol, and this is like a main square, and it's been bombed out, as you see, but a lot of people, that the poorer people lived in those bombed out areas. Um, and uh, he, he, what he would have to do, when he came into Madrid, he'd unload the truck with the supplies, um, uh, and then he'd go to the, uh, he'd go to the quarters in uh, the Salamanca section, which was the, the section that they didn't bomb that he lived in. Um, and they didn't bomb it because they had a lot of um, uh, sort of, they had some of Franco's, they had people hidden that were fascists within the city and uh, they were called the fifth column. But, and Franco knew where they were and Mussolini and Hitler knew where they were, so they didn't bomb that area. So, but nobody knew, and, but then they'd come and they'd assassinate people at night. But, um, so, so then he'd come back, and it was also the area that was very rich, the very rich area. It's right away where the um, Prado Museum is and where all the government places are. So he would go and he'd, he'd be waiting there because all the people came from that area. So they'd pick up people there. And people that were witnessing the evacuation, it was really sad because the mothers didn't want their children to die. And they were being bombed every day and they lost children. So they had to make a decision. Am I going to give my child to this man to take away to an area that isn't being bombed and then they'll be alive after the war and I'll see them or should I keep them with me? And it was really, really, really hard for them to make that decision. And so this is a witness of one of the evacuations. But the cruel world goes on, and those dramas mean nothing. Thus, each family kissed its children, and in haste, seizing the precious cargo, the buses departed. Some children were weeping, and others were waving goodbye with their little hands. Their white handkerchiefs seemed like white doves that in their tragic flight Fred fled from the shells of the hunter, and the planes and the bombs, seed and terror and death. So I was telling you a little bit about, this is from a letter, where he's showing that it's Madrid, and we're, we're looking at the different fronts. Um, and they would come in through the Jarama front, which was from Valencia. But all the other ones, they had mountains that they couldn't get by, or they had rivers that they couldn't get by. Um, so it was, they really, and then the International Brigade was down here. And so they, the, the nationalists couldn't um, invade the, um, they couldn't stop them. They couldn't shut off the supplies. So they keep, they tried to shut off the supplies. They wanted to, because they wanted to starve all the citizens, but they couldn't. So that was part of a letter. And then he, um, what happened was um, his truck broke down. So he was in Madrid for two weeks. So he decided he was really going to get to know Madrid and know what was going on in Madrid. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know how much party it was. But at, at Ernest Hemingway was there, and he was a big partier. And John Dos Passos was there, and he was too. But they were having, um, they had bread lines that would begin at 4 o'clock in the morning. So you would go and you, people would stand at 4 o'clock in the morning at bread lines. And then they had the refugees, a lot of them were living in the subways, just on the grounds of the subways to, to keep away from the bombing, because Madrid was always being bombed. And this is the, and then the journalists lived in the Hotel Florida in the Gran Via. And that's where Ernest Hemingway was, Joe Dos, Dos Passos, John Dos Passos, and all, um, all these people. And they would go and they would um, uh, go to a bar and drink that was nearby. Um, and so Barton would go and he would drink at that bar. And so they, that, that he um, met a lot of the journalists. And one of them from Germany, um, no, it was from um, Denmark. He said, well, why don't you be, follow me and go with me through the war zone, and we'll, I'll show you exactly what it's about. 
Now this is La El Telefonica, and that's where all the communications took place. So what would happen is all the journalists would go during the day, and they would be able to, um, uh, they would go to the front, and then they'd come, and then they'd wait in line to go and get out by Morse code their stories at night. So they had to wait. But what happened is, is that this was bombed all the time because they knew that there, the journalists were there. And then there were people that were refugees out here because they wanted to know how their families were doing and they thought there was a lot of information there. So anyway, they walked to the front lines, which wasn't far away from the Hotel Florida. And all these children were helping them build walls that were the poor children. Um, and then they embedded themselves in the trenches with, um, with the troops. Um, and so they, they were, he was able to find out exactly what was going on. So this is a hospital tent. And there was a lot of war going on in the front. And then they take them in these hospital tents. This was actually part of a museum. Um, that Charlie and I went to um, with that, that had a diorama of this. So then they do this hospital, um, working with hospitals. And this was the first war that they were actually able to do blood transfusions at the, trunk, uh, at the front. They never were able to do them before. So he worked in these tents, decided he wanted to become a doctor. And here are some of the... Um, here are some of what the Abraham Lincoln Brigade um, and many of the foreign correspondents. This is from Louis Fisher, who visited the Franco Zone, became loyalists because practically all the numerous journalists and other visitors who went to loyalist Spain become active in the cause. Even the foreign diplomats in the military attaches scarcely disguise their admiration. Only the soulless idiot could have failed to understand and sympathize which is true. So at one point, um, the, they, they went, this is the university where they had the university front. So all these journalists crawled in a tunnel. So they had the fascists were in the middle, they were stuck in the middle in that big um, hospital over there. That's a clinical hospital. And then um, they also, had houses around. Is that in Florida? Hmm? Is it Florida? No, not. Yeah, all right, just checking. No. So anyway, <laughs> he and some journalists crawled underneath the hospital, and he heard that um, they heard that they were going to attack that hospital at a certain time, and exactly what was going to happen. Um, so that everything happened, just like they said, and it was all in the paper. So they were able to predict that, that, um, uh, that, that battle. And so it wasn't, they, they were able to win that battle because they could predict it. And I don't know if you all have heard about Gornica. Um, Gornica is a painting that's done, but was done by Pablo Picasso. And um, Guernica is a city in the middle of the Basque country. And all the Basques are Catholic, so they sort of are, uh, should be more respected by the fascists and the nationalists and the monarchists, but they weren't necessarily um, so. And it was kind of the cradle of liberty um, in Spain. So on um, April 26, it was market day, and all the farmers came to sell their food um, and most of the townspeople crowded in the, in the square. And it was, a, it was always, every week, it was always a, 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 a lovely time for everybody. And at 4.30, the German ground and air forces swept over the town. And they destroyed the major um, majority of the buildings. Their bombers flew overhead. And they scrambled. And they, they did a, a 20, 20 minute intervals until most of the buildings were gone. Then the next three hours, they destroyed the remaining building with incendiary bombs. And so they ignited the, and burnt, burnt these, the rest of the buildings down. And then they went into the square and they killed 100 of the remaining survivors with women and children. And that's how, that's, uh, that's called the, Blitz, the Blitzig? Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg, yes. And that's how they, they fought. So that's how they... Oh, no. 
yeah, shock and awe. And this is what they learned how to do in order to, uh, you know, order to do it in World War II. So they, they got pretty good at it. Uh-huh. Um, Bart headed to London um, via Barcelona for a coronation of King George, and he met his father there. Um, and he was going to meet his father there, and he was, he was thinking at that point, well, I'm going to go and I'm going to write a book about this whole thing. And then he got stuck in, via, um, in Barcelona because there was a loyalist rupture. You had all these, these entities that came together to be the populist government, and none of them got along. The Trotskyites hated the communists, and the communists hated the Trotskyites, and so you had and the, you had them all fighting each other. So it all came to a head, and so there was all this street fighting, and he got caught up for five days, and he was in the street fighting, and he was unable to fly um, to London. So he was one of the first people to get out of London, but he came. He went to the. He wrote this gave it to his father um, to take home so his father could have it published in the National Telegraph and, and New York Times, and um, National Telegraph and Boston Herald. So what had happened in Spain is that the nationalists, uh, that, um, and Franco kept taking in and Mussolini and, and Hitler because they had so many more guns, so many more people, they kept on taking more territory all the time. So they ended up um, moving to Catalonia, which is in the northwestern part where Barcelona is and all where um, all the mountains, the, um, uh, all the mountains are. Uh, and so he met up with um, this fellow named John Langdon Davies and the Duchess of Athol, and they hired Bart um, to work with this Eric Muggeridge um, to do the foster family, uh, the foster parent scheme. And what it was, as you see it right now, and um, you see it right now where they're doing it in third world countries where you adopt an orphan and then you give money to them and then you give them presents um, uh, and then you write them letters and you just kind of take care of them and help them along. So this blueprint was started by, by John Langdon Davies, my uncle, and um, Eric M Muggeridge. Um, so they created all these orphanage in Puchera and, um, and called Dedas to support the refugee children. And then they had English sponsors that would take, would give 25 cents a day to support each child. So if, if a child's family was an engineer, then they'd have an engineer do it. If you had a school teacher, so they'd sort of match them up and they'd write to them and it was very important to them, these kids that didn't have parents, that they had somebody that cared about them. Um, and so Bart was a truck driver at the beginning and he transported the orphanages from Madrid to P Puchera and then he organized and set up several colonies and joined Esme Odgers, she was from Australia, a coal miner's daughter who came there to help. And what they would do is they organized the colonies and worked together in preparing the buildings and doing things. And then they would go, P Puchera had a big train station, so people would all come in, refugees would come in from the train station. So they would go and feed the refugees that hadn't maybe eaten in three days, the little kids and he could take some of them into his orphanage, but he couldn't take all because they just didn't have enough um, supplies or places to live. So they would have to be very picky and choosy on who they took. This is John Langdon Davies, who was really the mastermind of it. He, he had a house in Ripoll, which was in Spain, and he was a scientist, and he was the, um, wrote for the, uh, the News Chronicle. Yeah. And this is Eric Muggeridge, who worked with, with, um, with Barton. And he was a, a former schoolmaster and a journalist and a cavalry officer. So this is Esme Odgers right here, the Australian gal that he worked with. And she was a member of the Communist Party. 
Now this was the first orphanage they, they had. Charlie and I went over and it's a private house right now. Um, and it's a farm and the lady was wonderful. She took us through and he lived in that orphanage um, with um, the youngest of all the refugee children, with Esme. And this is um, Castile de Torre de Rue Alp. And that is a private home right now. Somebody from Barcelona owns it. And it was one of his orphanages. And they had a big farm and they had cows and they had vegetables and they had potatoes and they, because there wasn't a lot of food. Um, so they had to manufacture and make all these, this food for the orphanage, for the orphans. So um, what are the accomplishments? What did he do? He oversaw the creation of the schools there and extracurricular activities. They had um, soccer games and they had football games and they had all kinds of things going on. Um, he also bought a printing press for the kids and the kids would publish bulletins so they could write what was going on in the colonies and share with their foster families. And then he traveled to Barcelona a lot because he had to get funds from the loyalist government. Um, and then he established many more colonies, um, other in Catalonia, in different areas because there were so many refugees and they just didn't have, um, they just did, they needed to have more of these colonies because this is, the kids got love and food and support and it was really wonderful for them. Um, um, and he worked right alongside with them in the garden and he'd write and translate the letters and nurture the kids. And then he'd also go around and he'd find cattle. People would all knew him and they'd say, okay, you can have three of my cows for your, or, or, or you know what, I've got a whole bunch of extra seedling potatoes, you take those. And then he'd take his own money and he'd buy chocolate and stuff for the, um, for the orphans. So he used his own money. And this is, um, they had all kind, every month they had one of these and they'd have about eight pages. And the orphans would write in it and there would be Esme and, um, and Barton would write uh, about what was going on. And then they'd have the, um, orphan, the orphans or the students would all write what was going on and then they'd send them over. Now this is one of the, the um, I just wanted to put one of the articles here. Um, I lived in a town called Lithenia. Two months after the war broke out, the enemy attacked the town. The last time the battle lasted for two days. They took the town and all the people ran away. I ran away with some boys. We came across a regiment of the enemy on horseback. They took us in a backyard where they used to keep the cattle and locked us up. We were there a long time with nothing to eat or drink. I finally climbed a high wall and managed to open the door and we all escaped. We crossed a river which was very deep and when we came out we were covered with mud. Without taking a rest we walked on and went through a mountain pass for fear that the enemy would find us. Suddenly we saw some militiamen coming toward us with arms. The men uh, were from uh, our republic and they took us to a town and fed us. We were grateful because we hadn't eaten in a long time. So this is just a, a, a example of um, so, so um, John Langdon Davis came to um, Puchera, uh, which is in the Pyrenees Mountains near France, and he was helping with, with BART, and he was helping set up everything and feed the refugees, and he was really absolutely smitten with, with, um, uh, with BART, and he writes, um, Carter has found out where to buy the cheapest market and has a wonderful ability to know, nose out good bargains. He has found 12 pounds of potatoes still in the ground in one place and six beef oxen grazing in another and has bought them at prices that would astonish Bas Barcelona people. And in John Langdon Davis had just been to Barcelona. He lost five pounds. And then when he came up to the orphanage where the kids were, he put on seven pounds, so he ate really well. Um, kids couldn't say Bart's name because it's not Spanish, good for the Spanish tongue. And there was this um, fellow named Nick Carter who used to be, um, he, he, they used to have all kinds of writings about Nick Carter, the detective. So they would always, they, they referred to him as Nick. 
Nick is very popular with the children and the local authorities. Wherever you go, you hear shouts of BART from children, many of whom were um, evacuated from Madrid by Carter in the first place. So here he is with his little, little, um, little um, refugees. And this is Esme over here. And there they are. This is from um, uh, the, the uh, uh, Mas Regalisa. And they took this picture um, to raise money. So then they had a big fundraising. And he went back to the States. And um, he it was organized at the Benford Hotel in New York City. And he spoke at the Exchange Club in, in Boston, and his father arranged it. Um, and he raised four, $40,000. Then he spoke at a luncheon. Herbert Hoover um, was very interested in the war and what was happening. Um, and he was um, invited to a luncheon at the Waldorf. And Hubert, Her, Hubert, Hubert Hoover used to live there and also um, used to live there a lot. So he had all these people um, who listened to Bart, and they gave, gave all kinds of money. <clears throat> then he went to Philadelphia, and he wanted to work collaboratively with the, with, the, in, with the Quakers. And he made an association with this fellow named Jose um, Weisberger. And he, he said he would visit um, Puchera, now from the Spanish Child Welfare. So the Spanish Child Welfare was an organization that said that they were going to give all their money to the Quakers. But um, Jose Weisberger went over to visit him, um, to Bart, and he ended up giving his money to Bart instead of the Quakers. <laughs> so this is about his speech right here. This is from the Nashua Telegraph. Um, and then when he comes back to um, Puchera, he, he was having a, a uh, uh, he was thinking about marrying Esme Audgers, the communist um, woman from Australia, and she um, betrayed him. So he once again, he got betrayed. Um, but he was given money for, his, for, for more money from the child welfare. And then in January of 20, um, uh, uh, 23rd, the 38th, um, 1938, he was driving from one of the colonies um, back to Puchera, and he saw the bombs coming, and his or orphanages were being bombed. So he went back as fast as he could. Um, the kids are all writing about how happy they were to see him and this sort of thing. Then he organized and he built trenches and refugee, ref refuges around the um, uh, the buildings that they had, and he got so distraught that he decided that he'd enlist in the um, British International Brigade. And the reason he did the British rather than the one in um, the Abraham Lincoln is that the Abraham Lincoln Brigade was made up of mostly of, of workers and communists, and Bart knew that his parents would be very upset. Um, so he ended up joining the British Brigade because the British Brigade had fought wars before and they had a real hierarchy. They knew how to fight. They knew how to plan the fights much better. So he enlisted in that. And he went to this place where um, it's an initiation where you just, um, you just go and you sign up. And then he went on February, in February um, uh, 1938. And then he went down to Albercete, which is... Um, far away, it's near Valencia, it takes two days to get there. And he um, was there for about three weeks. And then there was so much um, destruction going on at the Aragon front, they usually are trained for nine months. He was trained for three weeks and then he was at the Aragon front um, with his NCO, Alan Logan. Now this is Another of the um, orphanages they have that are at a hotel. It's a hotel now. It's about $900 a month. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Where is that located? That is called um, Bolivar. It's beautiful. Is that in Italy? No, no, no. It's in Spain. Spain. It's right near. Yeah. 
It's right. We, Charlie and I went up to find it, and I had this, this letter. So the lady who owned it invited us there for lunch. And it was very nice. We had a great big bottle of wine and, a, and, a, and a, like a five-course meal. And I kept thinking because he wrote about his meals in that place and all that. And it was kind of, you know, kind of eerie. Sometimes when you're writing something like this, you, you, you're living your life, but then you're living a life that's not even, a, it's, it's your life in your book, but you're just as aware of the life in your book as you are as your life. It's a very strange thing. I never knew that I would have this happen. So what happened in the Aragon Front is after all this training, there were, um, there were 500 members of the British Brigade and 200 Spanish loyalists with rifles, and they only had a couple of machine guns. And they were setting out for Batea de Cal um, Calisete. And Bart was chosen to be a scout, which is just really a dangerous position. And he was, by Alan Logan, chose to do that. And what you do is you go out and you scout and see what's going on, and then you come back and you say, oh, the fascists are over here. So it's a pretty dangerous position. Logan was the rear guard, and that's also a dangerous position. So they were at 8.55, they were marching around a corner, and they came face to face with the enemy and everybody scattered into the hillside and there were like thousands of fascists for their small number of 700 there were like 30,000 fascists that were all there so the men went off in squads and and they wanted to get over to the loyalist stronghold that was across the Ebro River but they had to go over the mountains before they got there. So they all were in little squads trying to get over the elbow of a river. So there was a man named Morgan H Harvard and his leg was crushed. So Bart volunteered to carry a structure or a stretcher with two others. Um, and then they came upon a, um, a pe uh, peasant's home. So he, they, they had to leave the fellow on the stretcher because they had to, they left him. But he did survive, but without his leg. But then they had to, so one of the things Bart did is he went and he went to a peasant's home and they gave him bread and wine for the 23 people in his platoon. And he ascended into the hills um, with all the surrounding gunfire. And, and April 4th, he found a peasant's barn, and the peasant in, invited them to sleep. This is all in a real mountainous area, to sleep in his barn with his donkey, and he left them food. Um, and then another peasant family invited them for dinner, and they had the date 1739 carved over their door. Charlie and I took these letters, and we tried, we went through these mountains, and we tried to find all these things, but we were not able to do that. Um, on the 6th, they, the peasants gave him a sack of food to share with his men. And on the 8th, there was a young female peasant who invited the group for sausage and bread and showed them a secret mountain path. And she said, you can't get through. The fascists were everywhere. Um, and you have to travel up and down the treacherous mountains. Um, so that's what they did. And Logan... Um, he was detected by some fascists and gotten into a battle, and Bart took five others over the top of the mountain. Um, and then when the fascists, they, the Logan's men beat the fascists, and the fascists fled, they heard gunfire at the top of the mountain, and they feared that the Carter group had all been killed. And so you can see what it looks like, what terrain looks like. So this is... Um, Alan Logan's letter, he wrote letters to um, my grandparents, and they didn't know what had happened to their son. They just didn't hear from him anymore. So they finally got this letter, and this is, this is the Elbro River, is right over here, and those are the loyalists were over there. So this is how they, you know, this, those are the mountains, and that's where the fascists shot Bart, right over there. That's his own map. That's Alan Logan's, the, Alan his Logan. NCO. So there's, there's information about him being missing. And here's in Spain where we were. Um, this is 
Puchera right up there. And this is Barcelona. So this is all Catalonia. This is where all the orphanages were, all up in that area here. And then Madrid is quite a ways away, as you see, as Valencia is. Now, he was trained down in Albacete. And then he went back up to Barcelona. And then he went up to Gandesa, this area right over here. And that's where he went missing. Bart did. He went missing. Um, so he had, he, con he they, the Winthrop worked his <coughs> butt off. He contacted his business partners in London. He contacted Herbert Hoover, Cardell, Cardell Hall, Summer Wells. We have all telegraphs from them and letters from them. Um, and, and the ambassador to Spain to try to get Bart out. But once you sign up for war, they say you can't get out. But he tried really hard. John Langdon Davies went up in the mountains in the front to see something about him. And then he wrote on, the thir on, March, 31st, on, on, um, on March 31st, that's not 1938, after Bart Battalion was surrounded, there were 141 soldiers missing. 44 were taken prisoners, leaving 97 unaccounted for, of which Bart is one. And then he said it's necessary to include Barton on the list of the 97 members of the International Brigade who were missing and believed killed. So they, after they received that letter and after they went through everything that they went through, they decided that they had to think, say that, you know, he, was, he, he, he wouldn't come back. Now, my grandmother, now she lived to be 87 years old, and I really do believe she still thought that he probably had lived. <coughs> so this is when the residence was given here, and this is an original um, what the house used to look like. And this is the plaque above the fireplace that they, that they had made. It was done by a fellow from Rockport, Massachusetts, and his name was um, Rikia. And he had done a lot of work for the World's Fair in Italy. And so they had him do this. And there, there are parts of his letters in there. That's the truck that he used to drive. Here he's protecting kids from the bombings of the plane. Now they're. They're, now they're, trying, they're selling the Red Cross house. And I really want that plaque. <laughs> I don't want them to, <laughs> I don't want them to, uh, to and they say, well, it's really hard to get off the wall. I don't know if we're going to be able to get it off in yeah, one piece. There are ways. Yeah, there are ways. <laughs> yeah. That should not. Yeah, it's probably screwed into the wall. Yeah. Well, it's, you don't want to take it and, and you don't want to throw it away. So anyway, this, this, I think that this is, this was, was um, when the, 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 it was given. Communities and groups within communities are occasionally called upon to pay reverent homage to outstanding cur courage and idealism of individuals among the young manhood who's theirs. Barton Carter was such a young man among Nashua's young manhood. Dedication in his memory of Barton Carter Memorial Chapter House of the Red Cross is an occasion upon which it is fitting to call his boyhood days in Nashua the joy which he had in living his vivid and enthusiastic interest in everything in his home and in his school and all with which he came in contact with as he developed into a young man which he could and did dedicate not to himself but to self-sacrifice for those who need as he believed was great. So it goes on. So kind of looking at his legacy, this is what blows my mind. I mean, I'm 71 years old. I've had a long life to do a lot. But he dot, went missing in two weeks after his 23rd birthday. And what he did was absolutely amazing. And this is what, I mean, I keep thinking, well, I should do more, this sort of thing. Um, his effect on the masses, he saved four to 5,000 children's lives in his 23 years, 
or but it was really in only a year and a half. And he created the Blueprint for Plan International, which continues to be a vital program in 50 countries. So it's continued today, that blueprint of giving money for, and, and having foster children. He led two dozen children, um, soldiers through Gandesa Mountains who survived who wouldn't have survived. He spoke beautiful Spanish so the peasants, he could get anything he wanted from the peasants, so they, he kept them going with their food and everything. And he provided hope, nurturing, and guidance to all those he touched, which changed their lives. Um, I'm just going to tell you this story because I know I'm going on, but there's this wonderful man who just passed away in December, and I think he was um, almost 100. And he went to Williams with, with, my, with my uncle, and his name was Farney, um, 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 Farnsworth Fowles. And Farnsworth Fowles, um, uh, he, his parents were missionaries from Turkey. So he came from a very different background than Barton came from, but they both worked on the paper together at Williams. So they were both good friends, but knew that they came from very different, different backgrounds, and they had different... At that time, they had very different visions of what they wanted to do in their life. And Farney um, ended up, he worked for CBS over in, in Edward R. Morrow during World War II. And then he worked over in Turkey for a long time. And then he worked for the New York Times. But he was, I, I was trying to find people who were alive. Because by the time I started writing this book, I was, you know, I was no spring chicken. I had already retired after 35 years. So a lot of Barton's friends were really over the hill. But he was just so excited about the book and wanted to know all about it. So um, Charlie and I went up to see him in his nurse, nursing home in uh, um, East Thetford, Vermont. And he was, um, he, he was like, Oh, I just have to give um, Barton Carter's niece a big hug. He said, you know what? He changed my life. He said, I saw what he did. I thought what he did was so wonderful. And, and he said, I just, um, he was the one who was responsible to have Barton's name in the chapel in Williams. He, he, he went to the, um, <laughs> Uh, to the head of Williams at that time, and he said, I think it's horrible you don't have him on the, in the, where the Second World War people. He was one of the first people to fight fascism, and look at what he did, and you're not. So they ended up having, um, uh, putting him on the plaque there. Um, and he said, because of him, I led, led a very selfless life, and I tried to be, he tried to be my model of who I wanted to be. And he said there were a lot of people like that who saw what he did and did that. So the, then his effect on his family, um, his father was the chairman of War Finance Committee, and he, he organized and he sold war bonds. And New Hampshire was known as having sold more war bonds than any other New England state, you know, including Massachusetts, which had a much bigger population. And then his company um, supplied the arms, um, armed services with equipment. So they, they really did, the National Corporation did a lot during the war um, to help the armed services, which is great. And my grandmother became very philanthropic, and she was a pillar of her church life. And also, she was a lifetime foster parent. She was, he picked two foster children for her. But then after the war, she, um, they all went back to Spain. So she couldn't have them any, anymore because um, they were in Franco's territory. Um, so then she had some from Germany. And she worked very hard being a foster family. And with me, I really became an author, and I, I, I really was searching on a quest, how, do, how can I make difference in people's lives? And I think what he did for me is I have no fear of death at all. Um, and then I also, this is kind of crazy, but I kind of feel that sometimes our ancestors have a lot to do with who we are. And there are people that are very much like us that live before us. And it might be a grandmother, or it might be an uncle, it might be a great uncle, but we think, oh my gosh. And then sometimes I feel like, you know what, he, he really wanted me to write this book. It was something that he really wanted me to do because he was never able to do it. So I think sometimes 
that does happen. There is some sort of a, 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 a I don't know, it's sort of a spirit or, a, or, or, or some sort of a communication that you don't even know is a communication. Yeah, and it's like, okay, you know, this is what you have to do. And you just sort of listen and you just sort of say, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was his communication. Yes, yes, yes. But I, I mean, I certainly don't have any other way of communicating with him other than that. Wish I did. <laughs> Wish I did. <laughs> Okay, so Albert Camus says, said this, it was in Spain that men learned that one can be right and still be beaten, that force can vanquish spirit, that there are times when courage is not its own reward. It is this, without doubt, which explains why so many men through the world regard the Spanish drama as a personal tragedy. And it really was. So, let's see, I have, this is, I'm, I'm finished with my presentation. Um, Thank you. Thank you.